Everything looks better with a dram in your hand. Hello and welcome to the Cask 88 Lock-In episode 12. Now lock-in is much more by choice now rather than being compulsory, so maybe it's time to change the script a little. I've just been sitting so far in my comfortable chair letting the whiskies come to me. But Scotch whisky is such an integral part of the landscape that it's high time that I went out to where the whiskies are being made themselves to show you the places where your whisky comes from. This week, Fife, the ancient kingdom and modern county just to the north of the fourth estuary, a short hop over the water from Edinburgh. Now in its time, Fife has been a great hotspot for lowland whisky distillation, but only Cameron Bridge Distillery really survived unscathed until the modern day. But Scotch whisky abhors a vacuum, and in the last few years we've seen new distilleries breaking ground in the ancient kingdom of Fife, and now in 2020 we're seeing some of these distilleries becoming really quite established. The lowlands shall rise again. So join me on a journey to Lindor's Abbey and King's Barnes distilleries to find out a little more. Oh boy, I think I've forgotten how to deal with real 3D people. I think I need to readjust. I've enlisted the help of one of the other personalities I developed during lockdown to help me readjust to social interactions which aren't taking place through a Zoom call. Hello! Right, the first thing to do is to remove the extra dimensions. Now on Zoom, everyone is presented to you on a nice flat screen. But in real life, your conversation partner might insist on being really 3D at you, which can be very disconcerting. Ugh. So, the simple solution is really just to close one of your eyes. It's as easy as that. Third dimension eliminated. But this can become a bit of a hassle if you need to keep it up for a protracted amount of time. So I would recommend co-opting the use of one of those face masks that you no doubt have still lying around. And when placed carefully over one eye, ah, I can keep this up for ages. Incredibly simple, problem solved. Quick tip is to always be aware of your surroundings. Now, if you know, if you know where you're going to be, talking to someone, well, you can always scout the terrain ahead of time. Always make sure to carry some of your very smartest books around with you, and if you find an appropriate shelf or flat space, lay those books down behind you somewhere so that your interlocutor will have no choice but to associate those smart books with the person who's sitting in front of them. Moving on. Now, I usually like to be visible, but I find that Skype and Zoom often give you the choice of when that happens. Unfortunately, real life, your webcam is set automatically to always on, which is really a terrible breach of privacy if you ask me. Luckily, I picked up a tip from the trial survival guide, which will serve a purpose here. Now first, you need to take your towel, which you should always have with you, and place it over the head of your interlocutor. There, I am now completely invisible to them. Now. Bear in mind that depending on the thickness of towel used, you may also partially mute yourself using this technique. What? There, some tips of how to organize yourself when you start interacting again in 3D real space. Now I'll pass on some of my knowledge on how to react when your interlocutor actually wants to interact back at you in the next segment. For now though, I'm feeling much more confident. I'm gonna head off to my first distillery interview. Did you say something just then? I think my connection's not very good. We know that Scottish whisky is not a flash in the pan. The art of distillation has been here for a long time, most likely a secret technique first guarded by monks who were making something holier than water. The first written reference to Scotch whisky is now infamous. To Friar John Cor by order of the king to make aqua vitae eight bowls of malt. 
That was written in 1494, over 500 years ago. Where? Right here, Lindor's Abbey, on the banks of the River Tay, boundary between highlands and lowlands. Here, John Cor was living the secluded holy life, distilling spirits from malted barley. We've come up to Lindor's Abbey, the new distillery that was built here in 2017, with quite a historical weight on its shoulders. Lindor's Abbey! So, I'm standing here at the site where, not that it all began, but our first definite reference to whiskey in Scotland. This is Lindor's Abbey, and this is Drew Mackenzie Smith, who grew up around here and uh, is basically responsible for putting a distillery right on the site. So, 1494, the first reference to aqua vitae. Is this something we would recognize as whiskey today? I think the one thing historians will never agree on is whether when he commissioned the, the eight bowls of malt, whether it was for drinking or not. We obviously like to think it was for drinking. I would imagine it was fire water mm -hmm. in the sense that it wouldn't be aged in any which way. Um, but I also think uh, monks aren't different to, to the rest of us. So the fire water, well, yeah, <laughs> the, fire, the fire water was then slightly tamed, I think, by then infusing it with the plants, etc., that grew around. And that knowledge came with the monks coming over from, well, our monks here came from France. Mm -hmm. um, ironically, we're standing on turf from Ireland. So whilst we like to love the idea of being the spiritual home of Scotch whiskey, I always have to have a nod to the French and the Irish for, for their input. But yeah, no, to get to, to, to the point is, I think the aqua vitae certainly that we've produced, you can trace it all the way back because they are both a barley spirit. Mm. I suppose the aqua vitae then just remained that raw, like cleric or something like that, raw barley spirit. So I think people did drink it. We can be historically as accurate as we can be, and we've, we've stuck to our guns on that. But ultimately, it's got to taste nice. I can vouch for the fact that it does taste very nice indeed. But that's actually also, um, you know, a lot of young distilleries have the problem, you know, what we call whiskey can't be whiskey without those three years of aging. What do you do with the first spirits you produce? Can you wait with all of it? But you had the, the reference to Aqua Vita, and you had the local sort of plants and botanicals to infuse into it. So actually, Lindor's spirit was able to hit the market quite in that form. It was. When I, when, I, when I was building the distillery, the question I was definitely asked more than anything was, and sometimes it wasn't a question, sometimes it was a statement saying you will be doing a gin. Mm. And I thought, and I have nothing against gin, and I absolutely understand why most of the new distilleries bring out a gin, mm. but I felt that if the first spirit that came from Lindor's after 520 plus years was a gin, I think straight away it kind of undermined our story, but we stuck to our guns and uh, and I'm really glad we did actually. I'm really glad because I, I like the Aqua Vitae and fortunately so do lots of other people. And I think it'll grow as the whiskey comes out and the story gets known further afield. Mm. And Aqua Vitae, um, Ushkevea, Water of Life, Aqua Vitae, all of these, they, it seems like a very innocent name for what is fiercely powerful spirit, but so many countries call their fiercely powerful spirits the water of life. Yeah. So are they just being poetic or is there something a little more to it than that? I think there's, a, there's an element of, of the poetic about it, but I think also, I mean, I know there's record in Ireland of, of the Aqua Vitae being drunk before battle, for instance. So there is that kind of, it gives you spirit, it lifts you up to a point, <laughs> and, and then it does more. Um, but I think it also, as I say, it was medicinal, it was all sorts of stuff. But I mean, the actual phrase aqua vitae, water of life, mm. goes back to, I was reading just this morning, that the book of Revelations talks about the water of life, mm -hmm. uh, and that was AD 96. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so it's been around for a very long time. Yeah. It's, a, it's a word that's been used a long time, and I love the fact that it evolved differently around the world. So for us, it's whiskey, yep. going back to Uskabar. Yep. In France, it's Eau de Vie. In Scandinavia, it's Aquavit. Yeah. The uh, sort of the modernized form of uh, Uskabar whiskey, that's what we're here for. So yeah. I think we'll head just over the road and see how modern Lindors is doing it uh, from this space of history that's around it. We are now in the mighty beating heart of Lindor's Abbey Distillery. The three stills, wash, two spirit. And uh, I'm here with Gary Haggart, head distiller. But this is the modern Lindor's Distillery. So what is the distillery style for Lindor's Abbey? So the, the distillery style at Lindor's Abbey is, is fruity, 
it's floral, it's robust, and it's complex. And that's something that I really, myself and the team have strived for. Every time you go to a bottle of Lindor's, you find something new in it. I don't want somebody to pick up a glass of Lindor's and know exactly what they're going to get from it as soon as they lift it to their nose or their mouth. We went for long fermentations. We run the spirit stills slow when we're on the cup. We take the gentle running of the wash still. We have our three core casks, but we fill a lot of different style of casks as well, just to find out how our spirit works in these casks. It's very complex and looking for that complex style that gives the consumer something new, something that maybe just not quite come across before. Mm. Uh, we keep on saying whiskey, but actually this distillery is young enough that uh, Lindor's whiskey doesn't yet exist. So how long do we have to wait until it's ready? That's correct. So the first cask was filled on the 20th of December, 2017. So I think we're around about 90 days, something like that, possibly. There's a bit of a buzz now because we're all very much looking forward to that date. Lindos Abbey is a lowland distillery yes. and you know, until recently, we haven't seen that many lowland distilleries in the pack, but there are other lowlands opening up along uh, with you guys, you know, Fife itself is becoming quite a region. Do you think we're time? it's time for a lowland renaissance of whiskey? I think we are seeing a renaissance. We are definitely seeing a lot more lowland distilleries coming out. Fife's very well known for its farming area and its crops, so it makes sense. There's a lot of barley gets grown here, so you would expect distilleries to come up as well. I personally don't want to be within the confines of having to create a lowland spirit yeah. and everyone's expect, don't get me wrong, I would like to think that we can create that, but we worked with the distillery process to make a style of character that she's happy making. Yeah. If you've got a character that you can make regularly, and consistently stick with it and go with it. But I think the beauty of being able to do different styles of spirit is fantastic. We've played around with the casks, we've played around with different fermentation times. Yeast, I believe, can give you so much variations in different style. So we're at a position now where we've decided, right, let's go and try a new yeast strain. The twin spirit stills, identically engineered, get fed with the same spirit, get the same steam, but two different characters come out the end of the stills. So try as hard as you want. Sometimes, for whatever unexplicable answer, you get something different from what you were expecting. Well, one level of control that we definitely can exert is the wood type. So I think that's where to head next, the maturation warehouse. Right, and now here in the maturation warehouse at Lindor's with Elliot Wynne Higgins, the custodian of the casks. This is the bit where Cask 88 get really excited. Cask is in our name. We love casks. So please tell us a bit about how Lindors view their casks and what kind of casks you get. So typically uh, the Lindors policy, uh, we have three core traditional casks that we fill into. Uh, the first one being uh, our Old Forester bourbon barrel. Uh, the second one along uh, is sourced from Miguel Martin and that is our Oloroso sherry butts. Is that the one you're leaning against just now? That's the one I'm leaning on just now. And lastly, uh, we have the Jim Swan cask or the recipe cask uh, mm -hmm. called the STR, mm -hmm. which are typically ex-Spanish or Portuguese red wines with the, the STR process, which is your shaved, toasted and uh, recharred cask. Um, so what does a, a shaved, toasted and recharred red wine cask bring to a young whiskey? It brings the, uh, the blend alive really, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a fantastic cask, whether it's blending or single cask. Um, obviously the, the majority of the samples that we're sampling at the minute are all single casks so a few of them are still very at the young stage or immature but something that we're all picking up on on that early stage is that consistent character yeah. and for me as long as we've got that character coming through 10-15 years down the line mm. we know we're doing everything everything right. That is really comforting and really exciting and I guess being in this industry has taught me some patience but Honestly, the day when Lindor's whiskey is out cannot come soon enough. Elliot, thank you so much. Thank you very much for your time. Cheers. I understand Lindor's want to be barley self-sufficient. How close are you? Well, we're, we're pretty much there now. When our first two years, all our barley came from Fife, but we wanted to bring it closer to home. Um, so fortunately, you can see just in the background, so this is a priest burn field is being harvested just at the moment. And this is, these are fields that have been in, in the family for over 110 years. So it's great that we're kind of using the barley from 500 meters from the distillery. So we're getting 
half our barley from Park Hill Farm, which is where we're standing now, and the other half of our barley from Brayside of Lindor's Farm, which again is about quarter of a mile behind me here. So it's great, it's all, all Laureate barley. The carbon footprint is getting smaller by the, by the season. So now that we've got it established, this is what we'll continue doing. And fortunately, both farms are very sizable, so they can supply our current needs and our, our growing needs if we start upping production. So it's fantastic that we are using barley from here, but at the moment we're not maltsters, so it has to travel away to be malted and then comes back. Roger, my cousin, is the chap driving, <laughs> driving the combine and Richard over at Brayside. We, we've known each other all our lives, so it's a really small little sort of family affair. Drew, things are opening up again. People will be able to visit Lindor's again. How soon is that day coming and what plans have you got for when it does? Well, we've already begun welcoming people back in in a very obviously measured way, etc. And we thought, because we're getting phone calls all the time, so we began tours about three or four weeks ago, but they're completely different in the sense that a lot of it is video based. So people can come in and the sit spaced out and so they can hear about the processes and they can see, they can go to the Abbey Ruins and look into the still house. You, you're beginning to get the feeling of, and it sounds corny, but we're kind of getting to this sort of new, new normal. Yeah. Um, and we're loving it. It's lovely, great seeing people back here at Lindor's. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, what I've seen today, the distillery is operating beautifully. Everything is humming. Casks are quietly sitting. Barley is growing and being harvested. Everything is go. So it'll be fantastic if people have the chance to come and see it for themselves. Yeah. Drew, thank you so much once again. It's been a pleasure. Welcome back. Now, as you just saw, when you head out there into the world, the people you meet may well want to interact back at you, say by talking or something. Well, this next set of tips is focused on helping you readjust to what to do if that happens. Ah, you're back. One advantage that real life does have over Zoom is that the bandwidth is almost unlimited. This means that you can often actually respond in real time to what people are saying, and you can even use facial expressions in the place of words, which can save you a whole lot of talking. Allow me to demonstrate. Uh, Sam, tell me, how has your day been so far? Ah, so what happened was I went out to the shops last week and of course these days you always have to have a mask with you so I put the mask in my pocket and went on my way. But when I got to the shops it turned out that there wasn't actually a mask in my pocket. It's quite possible that it fell out on the street and then I'm thinking, well what if my horrible mask was picked up by some dog? Can dogs get coronavirus? I don't even know if they can. If they can, can they just hold on to it, you know, just for safekeeping like and then will they give it to someone else? Anyway, but they wouldn't let me into the shop without the mask anyway. So the whole thing was kind of moot so I had to go back and get myself another mask. And that second mask, I put it very safely in my pocket that time because I thought the first one did fall out and I didn't want that to happen to me a second time, especially because I didn't want to get all the dogs in the neighborhood infected with the virus, you know what I mean? Ah, that was a good workout. I'm glad I still remember those. Now, as you've seen, I've been doing a lot of interviews during lockdown. And one thing I've gotten quite used to is having a little notebook of prompts behind my laptop screen, just to remind me of what I wanted to say next in case I've forgotten the question, gotten distracted or just let my mind wander. Now this is a life hack that I would actually like to carry through to real life. It can be very useful, but it does require a little advanced preparation. There, all set up. Now I can demonstrate. <clears throat> Oh, that is too good. Oh, great. So, what's your favourite whiskey? My favourite whiskey? Oh, well, now you're asking a question. I don't really mm. think I could choose That's just nice. one. The Lowlands is the most underrepresented whisky making region in Scotland. The farmland may be great, the weather may be clement, but somehow whisky making took better hold in the highlands and on the islands, locations a bit further from the capital city and its ability to generate tax collectors. The Lowlands slumber is ending, though. In the last few years, a host of distilleries have opened up, eager to prove that Lowland whisky is very much alive and well. 
Kings Barnes Distillery filled their first cask in 2015 and have some very big plans for how to continue. Kings Barnes! So I have returned to the East Nuke of Fife here at Kings Barnes Distillery to see how they do things up here. And I'm here with um, the distillery experience manager, Michael van der Veen. Michael, thank you for having us here. Uh, no troubles at all. Um, welcome to Kings Barnes Distillery. First, right out the door, why the name Kings Barnes? Well, um, we're just located next to uh, the little town of Kings Barnes, and that would have been named Kings Barnes because um, in the 1200s, when they built Falkland Pal Palace, uh, which is located just down south here, about 20 minutes away from here, um, they needed a space to grow barley, to grow food for the armies when the royalty would come up to the palace. Um, and here at Kings Barnes, they had big sheds uh, with storage for that food. And I've actually heard that some of Scotland's best barley is grown here on the East Nuke. Is that something you've taken advantage of? Yeah, absolutely. We, um, we only use five barley. We use barley uh, from local farms, uh, send it down to York in England to get malted um, all the way down south. The Wien family who own this distillery own several of the farms on, on, site, on the uh, five coast. Um, and they want to, they wanna of course, use their own product in, in their own whiskey. Hmm. So one of the taglines for this distillery is from dream to dram. We'll investigate the dram a little later, but what was the dream? The, the dream all started with a local golf caddy here at Kings Barnes Golf Course, just a mile down the road. Um, he uh, had Americans come to him asking for whiskey, had to send them all the way to uh, Perth or Creef or um, Edinburgh. Uh, no distilleries at that time were nearby, so he thought wouldn't it be a great thing to have a, a distillery here in uh, the home of golf at, at St. Andrews. Did he sort of, did, did, did he bring this dream out from himself or did he get a little help? He did get a little help. Uh, back when we were still part of the EU, he got a, a, a grant from the EU um, to help start a new business. Uh, he also had several investors helping him at that point uh, until he realized just how expensive a distillery is. And then he got the Weems family um, involved who eventually uh, taken the whole distillery over. Mm. So the Weems family have uh, been very successful independent bottlers, that all kinds of uh, single cask whiskies, blended malts and blends, and now uh, their own distillery here at Kings Barnes. We uh, are quite close to the Firth of Tay here. Officially, it's the Highlands up there. So we're a lowland whiskey here. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very much the, the, the re-emerging of lowland style whiskey. Um, for, for many years here in Fife, it was only Diageo's plant down there that was making whiskey. Uh, now there's more and more distilleries coming uh, to the area, creating that l l nice, light, uh, very approachable whiskey style that, that's known as the lowland style. Uh, so um, our major majority of our casks are, are bourbon casks, and we are looking for that light floral style uh, not the big heavy uh, sherry cask or, or peat influences that you find up north. Well, we're going to head a little deeper into the distillery and see what other secrets we can unlock. Well, I'm here in this, the iconic dovecot or ducat of the distillery uh, with distillery manager Peter Holroyd. And we're standing above the first cask filled here. We are indeed, yeah, cask number one, the first fill bourbon. Interestingly, you know we're never going to be able to call this one whiskey because this isn't a bonded warehouse. So what we actually did was we, we paid the duty on this and of course it's aging, it's maturing, it's, it's going to taste great but we're never going never gonna to sell it as, as whiskey. It's only five years ago that uh, your first whiskey was put into its cask but only this year in 2020 uh, you got the World Whiskey Award for Best Lowland Whiskey. So does that mean you've done it? Have you perfected the whiskey already? Is there nothing left to do? Oh, we're very, very proud, uh, the team and I, of, of, of managing, to get, managing to get that. It's important to establish a distillery style, first off, and that's the same for any distillery. Um, I think we've, we've done that, certainly, with Dream to Dram. Um, you know, we've, uh, we've given people an idea of what to expect from us. Um, what actually is the wood policy here at Kings Barnes? Yeah, so the uh, vast majority of what we fill is exactly the same to this, this bad boy, uh, first fill bourbon, um, and that's just because it works. We're making a very light, fruity, kind of fruit-rich but floral style of new make spirit. So same as any other distillery, you're trying to pair your, your, your new make spirit with a cask. Um, so we find that first fill bourbon works beautifully for that. You know, um, you get all these lovely kind of tropical notes coming through which is a mix of the, the wood and, and the spirit itself. 
um, and a nice wee bit of spice in the end. We're using shaved toasted rechard casks from Portugal. 10% of that uh, maturation matured whiskey goes into the Dream to Dram. The other 90% is first fell bourbon. Uh, we're dipping into Oloroso sherry butts from Spain, and these are the these are the real deal. You know the Solera system, saturated in sherry. Um, but we've got I think 20 different cask types that we're using now for for filling. But um, the nice thing about that is the family um, that owns and operates the distillery is is very much involved in all those decisions as well. Um, you know, Isabella Weems does all the cask selection, and she she does the casks, and I make sure with the help of uh, the team here that we're, we're making a, a consistent, high quality, new make spirit um, to be able to go into them. Yeah, so we've got, we've got a lot of exciting plans for the future in terms of releasing some of them going forward. Mm. But as you say, your real responsibility, well, the, the, your primary one is that new make spirit that goes into the casks. Exactly, yeah. So let's take ourselves to the still house and have a look at that. Let's go for it. All right, so Peter, we're in the nerve center of the King's Barns operation here, the still house. We're surrounded by washbacks, mash tons, still steaming away behind us. So what is the King's Barns philosophy for making whiskey? Well, right from the outset, we knew that we wanted to achieve um, a very light, elegant style. Um, so every aspect of what we do here, right from the choice of raw materials to the way that the plant is engineered, to the way that we process it, it's all been geared towards driving as much of that that character, that style, into the dram as possible, because that's the important thing at the end of the day, taste, flavour. So, mash ton, we're quite a small distillery, very small team as well, um, 1.5 tonnes mash. We achieve a very clear wort coming out of that mash ton, going across for fermentation. Quite long fermentations as well, so we have plenty of time for the yeast to do its job. Interestingly, we use two strains of yeast as well. Um, one of them is a French yeast, um, which is the one that gives us kind of all our top fruity notes. Um, and the other one's, uh, it's called Anchor, and it's been used for decades. It's an old stalwart. So it's very important to make sure you get the, the flavor in the fermentation, you know, from the yeast, because the stills are just going to condense that flavor. So you need to make sure it's, it's in there in the first place. So the yeast kind of makes your raw materials and then you run the stills in a way to kind of focus those flavors, almost like a prism to concentrate them. And then you get your new spirit rolling off. Exactly, simple as, yeah. With the stills, uh, we run them very slowly. So lots of copper contact, lots of reflux is what we're, what we're looking for. Um, you may be able to see nice, nice long line arms there as well. So again, trying to get as much kind of copper contact uh, as we can and we run them really slowly so you get the, the steam rising up the necks uh, fa falling back into the, into the pot again. Again this is all kind of contributing to, to targeting um, the kind of elegant section of the run and leaving behind any more fainty or heavy elements um, but if you notice our new make spirit there's still enough weight in it that you know it, it takes maturation um, you don't want something so light that you know maybe it's uh, the wood, wood is going to overport, overpower it, and that's where selecting the right, the, the right casks is, you know, is crucial. Mm. So these stills, they look like they really have the classic shape, you know, uh, onion at the bottom, nice tapering neck. They're fantastic, and the nice thing about the distillation side is it's all old school. So it's all manual steam valves, you know, we've got the human touch there where you can just crack it just a tiny wee fraction, you get the right flow rate of spirit running and everything else. Whereas over here in the mashing side, this is where we've got um, you know, a little bit more automation. You know, we can find out what all the temperatures are in the different vessels and what have you. So um, kind of a modern distillery, but a lot of traditional values as well. That really seems to be the story with King's Barns. Again, you know, a modern building built into the site of a really old building. Um, I think that sort of straddling that, that, that line between past and future, it's really serving you guys very well. Yeah, no, thank you. Aye, it's uh, for the building. It's you know taking a taking an old farmsteading that it was falling to rack and ruin, um, but it had bags of potential. So giving it a new lease of life, um, and the same for same for the distillery here. You know, well, it's great to see that everything here is in really good hands. Peter, thank you very much. Cheers, my pleasure. We find ourselves at the bar that visitors will see at the very end of the tour, and I think this is a great place to. So to talk a bit about the architecture of the distillery, uh, King's Barns has a beautiful fusion of 
old and modern, just like what we see behind us here. So how did King's Barns get to looking the way it does now? The, the Weems family knew from the, from the word go that they wanted to put a, a, a timeless um, distillery down mm. that would last for many, many years. They've really spent a lot of time and effort into making, making sure it looks right and that it feels right. Um, so this room, for instance, you, you can see the little clan gang glasses cut in the wood. It's really the details that they're, that they're going for. Uh, this room is not just a tasting room, we do events here as well and it's, um, it's just a beautiful place to be. Uh, since uh, the 1st of August we've, we've opened up for tours again. Uh, it's been successful as in we've got people coming in in a safe way, um, more than we expected. Uh, we, we, we thought it was going to be very quiet but it's, uh, it's, it's luckily been um, uh, busy enough. But only five tours a day rather than the 15 that we would have done last year. So it's, it's a completely different scale. Um, whiskey wise we've got a few uh, new whiskies coming on the market later this year. Uh, very different than what we've done so far, although you will still recognize the, the King's Barn signature if you'd like. Excellent. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing where it all takes you. And for folks who do want to visit the East Nuke of Fife, get in uh, a few rounds of golf and then stop off at the King's Barn's distillery. It's a really fantastic day and this may well be the sunniest part of Scotland. By far, yes, <laughs> yes. Well, Michael, it's been a real pleasure today. Thank you for showing us around and thank you to Peter as well. Um, it's, uh, it's been wonderful to see King's Barn's distillery today. Well, it's great having you. Thank you for uh, dropping by. Speaking of drops... Would be rude not to. Mm. <laughs> Slangeva. Slangeva. <laughs> Back in the safety of my lockdown cave. But I think that all went pretty well, all things considered. Now my tips helped me to stay sharp and focused during my interviews, and we managed to get a great insight into those rising and up-and-coming distilleries of Lindos Abbey and King's Barns. Now I've saved my final tip for possibly the most stressful of real-world situations. The fact that nobody out there has a mute button. So you may have to get creative if you're looking to keep people quiet. Spring bank, there's your full-bodied whiskey. That's something I can really go for. So ultimately, no, I think that if you're telling me to talk about my favorite, it's just a little bit... Uh, So there, perhaps that was the answer all along. A nice dram shared. That really is the biggest advantage the real world has over a small and digital window. Now my effusive thanks go out once again to the folks at Lindor's Abbey and King's Barnes Distilleries. Thank you for taking me in, answering my questions and taking me through the whole process. It's wonderful to see everything working properly and for guests to start arriving again, hopefully more and more as time goes on. See you again in the real world for a dram. Slanjava.